Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral, and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. We are so excited that you've chosen to worship with us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and you can watch our live services on YouTube. For more information about the church and how you can get connected, you can visit our website, ehconline.org. Now join us as Bishop Collins delivers a powerful, timely message. Proverbs 11, 1 through 3. Proverbs 11, 1 through 3, and I want to talk about a subject that is so much needed in the kingdom of God today. As we value what God values, we need to value integrity and character. Proverbs 11, 1 through 3 from the NIV. The Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor in him. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them. But the unfaithful are destroyed by duplicity, by double life, by double standard. Father, I'm asking you today, as I always do, speak from this platform to the floor. Speak to the one delivering your word and the ones receiving your word. Anoint us with ears that hear, eyes that see, hearts and a desire to draw nearer, my God, to thee. And when this word does what you promised it will do, you receive all the glory, the honor, and the praise. For we do it and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Without fail, every time that we drive through Framingham, Massachusetts, there are two thoughts that pop up in my mind. The first thought that comes is that when I drive through Framingham, the thought that our oldest daughter, Jessica, graduated with a four-year degree from Framingham State University, and it comes into my mind because she is the first grandchild on either side of the family to graduate with a four-year degree. Amen. The second thought that enters my mind takes me back to a chilly day in 1986. The exact date was Tuesday morning, January 28, 1986. It was on that day that Krista McAuliffe climbed aboard the Challenger Space Shuttle for what was to be her historic mission as the first citizen in space. She was a teacher and a graduate of Framingham State. But I want to tell you, church, that history indeed was made, but not the kind of history that we desired. Ted Engstrom wrote a book called Integrity, and he says, I only hope we learn something about the consequences of getting an F in integrity. And I assure you that we have not learned it, either in the church or outside of the church, because if there is anything that I would love to do, if I could just inject into all of our veins a desire for integrity, I would do that. On that day, the weather was cold, but what we as a nation did not know was that there were a slew of engineers who were fighting back the hot sweat of worried anticipation. There were questions running through their mind, and they were asking, would the booster seals hold in this kind of weather? Was it safe to launch? Knowledgeable engineers and designers said no. Influential executives and planners said yes. And so power overruled reason. Integrity was the victim. Richard Joy Dorch, who wrote a book called Fatal Deceit, tells this. Roger Bosjoli, he worked as a senior engineer in Morton Thiokol, the company that manufactured the boosters and the O-rings that seal the joints between the boosters and the fuel tanks on the NASA space shuttles. An expert on rockets, Bosjoli had carefully monitored O-ring malfunctions at low temperatures and warned NASA and Thiokol against any launch temperatures when the temperature dropped below 35 degrees. Chuck Colson and Jack Eckert in their book, Why America Doesn't Work, they chronicled Boyce Jolie's account of one of the most unbelievable disasters in American history. Listen very carefully, for we are going to learn a serious lesson on how a lack of integrity is not something to be sneezed at and to be treated as a small thing. On January 27, 1986, this is the night before the Challenger was to be launched. The temperature was predicted to be at a morning temperature of 18 degrees. Morton Thiokol's managers recommended the launch be scrubbed, but under pressure, the senior vice president, he took off his engineer's cap and put on a man management cap. 
Previously, Boyce Jolie had to prove that the flight was safe before launch would be approved. Now management turned the tables. Boyce Jolie had to prove that the seal would malfunction. In the end, ma management called Boyce Joyley's evidence inconclusive, and they approved the launch. That night, the story goes that Boyce Joyley wrote in his journal, I sincerely hope that this launch does not result in a catastrophe. The next morning, Boyce Joyley stood in the chilling air, and he watched the Challenger arc through the sky. At 60 seconds into flight, he breathed a prayer of thanks. Thirteen seconds later, the enormous pressure of the gases from the boosters blew past the rubber O-ring, still stiff and cold. Let me show you what happened while I tell you what happened. After it was a bitter cold but sparkling booster rocket ignited. It was a bitter cold but sparkling clear morning at Cape Canaveral. Here at the last seconds of the countdown. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. All the communications between the shuttle and mission. They found out that the cabin remains. They learned later that they endured three and a half minutes of terrifying free fall before smashing into the Atlantic Ocean at 200 miles per hour. Ted Engstrom said this, and I pray it for us. I wish only that these words about the urgent need for integrity could carry that same force of impact. Church, I told you on New Year's Eve night 2023, that the Lord is speaking to us that in 2024, if we are to live blessed lives and be obedient to him, then we must take into account and value the things that God values. And one of the things that I want you to tell you today is that the world and even Christians, we sometimes blow off integrity and we blow it off as though it does not matter. But I want you to understand that God places a high premium on both of them. And then I want us to understand that both of them go together, but while they both go together, they are not the same thing. Let me talk in your outline about the differences between integrity and character. And this is important because we need to understand that a person can have integrity and yet lack character. Number one, integrity recognizes behaviors that are wrong, while character deals with wrong behaviors. Integrity recognizes behaviors that are wrong, while character deals with wrong behaviors. Let me borrow this illustration from Hope Zeminski. Imagine that your child came home from school, and they told you this sad story about how a bunch of other kids were picking on and making fun of another boy by the name of John. After relaying the tale, your child puffs out his chest and he says, but I didn't do it, Daddy. I didn't make fun of John. You, no doubt, would be extremely proud of your child. Why? Because he has exemplified integrity. He refused to do wrong. Good for him. That's integrity. You may be that person you don't steal supplies from your office to work on at home. You refuse to lie and say that your child is 11 so she can't eat off of the kid's menu. You refuse to do the wrong thing. Thank God that's good for you. But watch now. The second time your child comes home, they share again with you the fact that the bullies at school were picking on and making fun of John. However, you notice this time that your child has a black eye. Worry starts to creep into your head until you hear the child say, but I stopped them, Daddy. I stood up for John and did something about it. They won't bother him again. And then again, pride in your heart would probably not be able to be contained. Why? Because you understand what your child has displayed is not only integrity alone, but they added character, which is even more wonderful. See, I want us to see something here today. Integrity is recognizing a behavior which is wrong and not joining in, But character is not only recognizing the wrong behavior, but also doing something about it. Amen. Character, it is seeing people who are being hurt and you take a stand. Character, it is knowing that you have friends and family who are doing what is not right. And yet you have the courage to confront them gently yet firmly. It's realizing that young women are being sold into sex trafficking. 
and not simply sitting back and saying that that is wrong. But when the offering to war against it is taken, you open up your wallet and you make the statement that says, I don't just have integrity, I have character because character doesn't just recognize wrong behavior. Character rises up and it takes a stand against that wrong behavior. Number two, integrity is the foundation of character. Integrity is the foundation of character. There was a man I read about by the name of Steve who was involved in a business meeting years ago in which one of their clients tried to persuade his boss to cut some corners that were at the very least unethical. And listen to me closely. Please understand today, church, that in a sin-cursed world, there are things that are legal. But as a Christian, we must ask the question, just because it's legal, is it ethical? And so this man's boss confronted the man, and he said something along these lines. He says, are you suggesting what it sounds like you're suggesting? That man hemmed, and he hawed, and finally said yes. That man, Steve's boss, stood up, and he said, this meeting is over, and so is our relationship. Then he stormed out of the office, but it was his office. The client sat there dumbfounded, as frankly so did Steve. Then his boss came back in 15 seconds later and he said, did you hear me? The meeting is over. Steve will show you the door. Then he sat down and he started going through his mail. Steve said, I knew my boss desperately needed the business this client offered, but he didn't want the client's bad money enough to cheat others. Listen to what Roger Jenkins says about integrity and character. He says it is the ability to do the right thing or choosing to do the right thing when you could get away with doing wrong, the wrong thing. You see, listen, church, integrity says that not only will I recognize what is wrong and not only will I seek to do something about it, but if necessary, I will remove myself from relationships with people who no longer walk in integrity. Pause for a moment. How many people are you connected to who have no integrity? Believe me, before this series is over, you will find out that their lack of integrity connects to you and causes you problems. Abraham Lincoln said this, I am not bound to win, but I am bound to be true. I am not bound to succeed, but I am bound to live by the light that I have. I must stand with anybody that stands right and stand with him while he is right and part with him when he goes wrong. Number three, integrity is the core quality of a successful and happy life. Character is the fruit. Integrity is the core quality of a successful life and happy life. Character is the fruit. Here's what it means. It means that I have integrity and character. It means that it affects everything I do and everything that I say. Number four, integrity is the voice of faithfulness. Character is the act of faithfulness. Integrity is the voice of faithfulness. Character is the act of faithfulness. Now, I want to talk about some of the issues that disable our ability to walk in integrity. And please understand that these are not all of them, but I believe that these are the most important ones. And our key scripture comes from Psalm 25, 21. May integrity and uprightness, the word uprightness is character, protect me because my hope, Lord, is in you. Now, the first thing that can disable us from walking in integrity, number one, is valuing reputation over character. Character. Valuing reputation over character. Let me put it like this. It is when integrity informs your heart that something is wrong, yet because you care more about what people think or will say about you than you do about what is wrong, character steps back and it won't confront the wrong that is being done. Matthew 27, 24. Matthew 27, 24. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. And then, church, he said these defining words. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. Let me lay a foundation of what was happening that day. Jesus has been hauled in front of Pilate, who had the power to set him free. The crowds were quickly becoming unruly, and the heat was on. Please understand that Pilate said, I can find no fault in Jesus. And even greater than that, I remind you again that Pilate had the power to set Jesus free. 
And the Bible says, as Jesus was standing before Pilate, Matthew 27, 19 says, while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But verse 20 says, but the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Now listen to me very closely, church. Instead of Pilate listening to the words of his wife, who said to him, let that man go, because I have had nightmares of what's going to happen if you don't. And even though he had the power to set Jesus free, the voice of the crowd overruled integrity in his heart, because listen to me, church. If you read the book of John, it also tells us that the religious zealots, they intimidated, intimidated him by telling him, if you let Jesus go, you will certainly be no friend of Caesar's. What is he saying? They are saying to him, if you want to stay in this political position, if you want us to speak highly of you and vote for you in the coming year, please understand, you better let Barabbas go and turn Jesus over for execution. And the Bible says that Pilate came in because he bought into the thought that if I don't do as they do, my reputation will suffer with the people and I will lose my clout with Caesar. So the Bible says he puts his hand in the basin of water. He is sending out a signal that he was washing his hands in front of them. Supposedly he is clearing the top of the guilt and placing it on them. I want to ask all of us a question. How many times have we figuratively washed our hands and walked away from things that we have the power to change because we were more concerned about our reputation than about integrity and character. I heard many years ago that sometime later Pilate lost his mind from guilt over what he had done to Jesus. And the, the, the story goes that he spent the rest of his life rubbing his hands together continuously every waking hour of the day, senselessly trying to wipe and rub away the guilt of what he had allowed to happen to Jesus. I don't know if that is true, and I can't find evidence of it, but this I do know. When we fail because we place reputation over character, the only thing that can wash away our guilt is the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Believe me when I tell you this. Most will never admit it. But I can assure you that there are many, many people who have suffered from the guilt of failing to see something that is wrong and make it right because they placed a greater import on reputation than on character. Let me turn another corner. Sometimes the enemy will cause people to attack your reputation in order to sucker you into a battle of words which then erodes your integrity, which then reveals what kind of character you really have. Let me say this. We place far too much emphasis on reputation, on what people think of us. Let me give you this nugget in your outline. If you will hold to integrity, character will restore your reputation. If you will hold to integrity, character will restore your reputation. 1 Peter 3.16 is what I've learned to live by. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. A judge was campaigning for re-election. He had a reputation for integrity. He was a distinguished and honorable gentleman of no small charity. His opponent was conducting a vicious and mud-smearing unfair campaign against him. Somebody approached the judge and they asked, do you know what your opponent is saying about you? Do you know he is criticizing you? How are you going to handle it? What are you going to do about it? The judge looked at his counselors and his campaign committee and he calmly said these words. Well, when I was a boy, I had a dog. And every time the moon was full, the hound dog would howl and bark at the bright face of the moon. We never did sleep very well those nights. He would bark and howl at the moon all night. With that, the judge concluded his remarks. That's beside the point, his campaign manager said impatiently. You've told us a nice story about your dog, but what are you going to do about your critic? The judge explained, I just answered you. When the dog barked at the moon, the moon kept on shining. 
I don't intend to do anything but keep right on shining. And I'll ignore the criticism as the moon ignored the dark. I'll just keep right on shining quietly, calmly, and beautifully. Listen to me, church. If there is one thing I've learned about integrity and character, listen now. They are of far more greater import than reputation. And if you will operate in integrity and character, please understand, people will seek to destroy and mutilate and attack your reputation. And there will be people who will buy into their lie. But know this about the God that you serve. If you will let him, he will make sure that if you hold on to integrity and walk in godly character, not only will your character restore your reputation, but God will expose the lies of those who sought to hurt you. And watch this. And simultaneously, he will open doors of opportunity for you that never could have been opened. And he will place you before people that you have no business standing before. And listen, he will let you know that everything thing that I let you go through because I was trying to get you to a higher place, a greater place. Now watch this. Let me quote Abraham Lincoln one more time. He said, if I were to try to read, much less answer all the attacks made on me, this shop might as well be closed for any other business. I do the very best I know, the very best I can, and I mean to keep doing so until the end. If the end brings me out all right, what's said against me won't amount to anything. If the end brings me out wrong, ten angels swearing I was right would make no difference. Valuing reputation over character has the power to disable our ability to walk in integrity. Number two, intoxication with power. Intoxication with power. I mentioned the late Dr. Richard George that he wrote the book Fatal Conceit. I want to tell you something, church. I read that book over and over. I've read it several times, though I've had it for years. And in it, he says, people who are intoxicated with power have the mindset only on their personal agenda. Let me show you how dangerous this one is. And please listen to what I'm about to say. We may start out not hungry for power, but if we do not remain humble when God begins to bless us and do great things for us, at any given time, any one of us can be intoxicated with power. And here is the danger in being intoxicated with power. This thing can so infect your soul that one day you will find out that it had such great power and sway over you that you will end up where you said you didn't want to be. You will do what you said you didn't want to do. And the reason being, you'll see say, I wonder how I got here, and it was because you were infected and intoxicated with power. Richard Dortz tells the story of a young man named Kurt. The story goes that when Kurt was in college serving God and mankind was his highest goal. He was a good husband, a father, a businessman, a civic leader. He had everything going for him, so much so that everyone around him noticed his superb leadership skills. And soon his friends in the community asked him to run for the office of county commissioner. His Christian commitment, his reputation for honesty, and his family values are what got Kurt elected. In spite of the heavy workload of that new position, Kurt continued to make time for his wife and his family and God. Before long, his excellent work as county commissioner brought his name and reputation before the political party officials when the position of state senator from his district came open. He was urged to run for the office as he was discussing this with his wife. She said to him, honey, be sure that this is what you should do. See, she had a sensing that Kurt was yielding to a pull that went beyond his desire to serve. It was no more about service that he wanted. He wanted position. Now, please plug into your outline, Deuteronomy 8, 17 through 18. I'm going to finish this story in a moment, but listen to these words. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. After Kurtz, re his election as a state senator, his life changed dramatically. He was now on top. He had everything he wanted. At the Capitol, he had people to meet and appearances to make. His life was his job. He now belonged to the public, leaving no or little time for his family. The long discussions that meant so much to Carol became fewer and farther between. 
When Carol frequently mentioned church or family to Kurt, he blew off her concerns as inconsequential, especially if she pushed too hard. She would remind him, maybe you should spend more time with the kids. Her warnings, however, fell on deaf ears, and that young couple began to pull apart. As position and power consumed him, greed got a foothold in Kurt's heart. And herein lies the problem. Everyone could see it but him. And it became that being with the people who helped him accomplish his goals was more important than God and family. Carol began to feel that he no longer needed her. Her feelings were confirmed when she learned that he had been unfaithful. With their marriage in shambles, Kurt and Carol separated, leaving their children's lives deeply bruised. Now watch. After his second term, the reputation that put him in office was no longer intact and recognizable by his constituency. He lost the election, listen to what I'm about to say, because the power that had so tempted him to the top vanished with the family that he loved most and lost. He's at the bottom now. He's looking up. He went to get help, but the problem is it's too late. He still lost his family, and listen to me carefully. It's because he fixed his sights on the temporary thrill, thrill of the moment that resulted in permanent loss. You may say to yourself, my power and strength, my hands, have produced this wealth for me. But you better remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to get wealth. Amen. Number three, lacking a fear and reverence of a holy God has the power to disable our ability to walk in integrity. Acts 5.29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Proverbs 29.25, Fear of man will prove a snare. It will ensnare you. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. You know, when I think about this point, if there is ever a need for us to get a greater fear of God and less fear of man, it's that time. Church, we have all kinds of abominable things going on in the kingdom of God because the church fears men more than we fear God. The church fears the government more than we fear God. The church fears men to the degree that it's almost impossible to recognize us from the world who say that we're on the Lord's side. Erwin Lutzer has a pastor friend who made this profound statement. Listen closely. There are three kinds of churches. Some will be complicit, participating in the culture without standing against it. Some will be complacent disagreeing with the culture but not actively opposing it. Then there are those that will be courageous, saying what needs to be said and doing what needs to be done and accepting the consequences without self-pity or anger. And I said, dear God, please make us the latter. Please make us at Eagle Heights Cathedral, the church that says we are not going to bow in greater fear and reverence to man, but we're going to bow to the name of Jesus. John Bunyan said this, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and they that lack the beginning have neither middle nor end. And what I want us to discern today, church, is that when you fear man more than God, you will lay down integrity and character to follow the crowd. More than a hundred years ago, Soren Kierkegaard warned that the age of the crowd was upon us. In such an age, Kierkegaard said this, people won't think of deciding for themselves. They would rather follow the advice given to children going to a party. Look and see what the others are doing and behave like them. Doesn't that sound like the church today? The truth needs to be told, and I'm here to tell it today, that we are living in that age right now, and the tragedy is that even those who don't agree with us are losing respect for us, not because of what we believe, but rather because we no longer stand up in integrity for that that we say we believe. No longer do we stand up and say, I'm not going to bow to you. We have allowed, the church has allowed the culture of the world 
to so wear us down to the degree that we have decided it is easier and better to join the culture of the world than to come against it and bring a light into the darkness. Hear this now. There are people, church, outside of the kingdom of God who are wondering what's up with the church. In PreachingToday.com, listen to this. In the wake of Ireland's landslide victory to allow same-sex marriages in their country, journalist Matthew Paris, who calls himself a gay atheist, publicly laments the church's wishy-washiness. He writes, even as a gay atheist, I wince to see the philosophical mess that religious conservatives are making of their own case. Is there nobody of, e of any intellectual stature left in the church to frame the argument against Christianity slide into just going with the flow of social and cultural change? Paris continues to lament. Can't these Christians see that the moral basis of their faith cannot be sought in the pollster's arithmetic? Would it have occurred for a moment to Moses, let alone God, that he'd better defer to Moloch worship because that's what most of the Israelites wanted to do? It must be surely be implicit in the claim of any of the world's great religions that on questions of morality and majority may be wrong. But this should be vividly evident to Christians in particular. They need only consider to consider the fate of their Messiah and the persecution of adherence to the early church. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, Paul said. Now, it was actually Jesus that said that. But here's the point that we must not miss. We must feel the weight and the gravity of what he just said. Because what this guy says raises some tough questions for the church. And it tells us what many of the world think of the church that compromises. So we ask the question, how did we get this way? Here's how we got this way. We have lost the courage to stand in integrity of what we once believed. And listen to this preacher. I know we've got the Holy Ghost and he will help us, but hear this. We have a part in which we must cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And if we're going to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, listen to me very closely. We must be courageous. And listen, courage is not a feeling of fearlessness. Dr. Mark Rutland in his book, Character Matters, says this. It is rather that willingness of mind necessary to act off of, out of conviction rather than feeling. One may actually feel quite fearless and act in a cowardly manner. Also, one may feel quite fearful and behave with great courage. Several years ago, I saw the article about the wire service that carried an account of a press operator in the Midwest whose employer had signed a contract to print pornographic magazine. This man refused to operate his press on that one contract. He went to his boss and he pleaded, allow me to work on any other project. Give me the worst hours in the shop. I won't operate my press when that magazine comes through. You know what happened to him. He was fired. He appealed to the labor union, which declined to support his quote unquote censorship. Now watch what I'm about to say. When Dr. Rutland discussed this with a pastor that he knew, the pastor laughed and he said, what a jerk, gagging at gnats and swallowing at camels. How big a deal is it? He doesn't have to read them or look at the pictures. That fool hasn't, hasn't responsibility in that matter. All he has to do is operate the printing press. I want you to listen to me and listen very closely. Even if we don't read something, if we help create that thing that goes against the character of God, we are complicit in it. You see, church, this attitude and spirit of lack of integrity, it has always been in some pulpits, but it's in there like never before. We are living in a time, church, where even preachers don't, don't embrace and value integrity. And I think that part of the reason is that it's a statement by a young pastor that he made to Richard Dorch. He said, your generation taught us how to preach, but not how to live. You taught us how to big build, build big churches and be successful pastors. But you didn't tell us what kind of people we're to be. Dr. John Maxwell says something that constantly stays in my mind. He says everything rises and falls on leadership. Let me tell you what that means to me, church. That means to me that as important as what I preach, as important as it is, Please understand that me trying to reach what I'm preaching is more important than me preaching it. 
Because what I have seen to be true in these many years of ministry, listen now, what gets on the leader for the most part gets on the people. If the leader has integrity, the majority of the people will have integrity. Dr. Oral Roberts, that late great preacher, said something else that sticks with me. He says, you young preachers understand you don't touch the girls, the gold, or the glory. Let me translate that. You don't mess with the opposite sex. You don't mess with God's money. And you don't play with the anointing of God on your life. And I have sought and will continue to seek to live by that in my life. And I've had people say to me just recently, one man said to me, you know what? You preach hard, preacher, and you, get, you hit us hard. And then he began to tell me about a men's ministry at his church. Some of the men were causing the preacher all kinds of trouble. And when I left, some of them said, they got together and they said, we can't let him come back. He's going to mess up what we got going on here. Let me talk to us. Hear my heart. I'm not trying to get in your business, nor am I trying to run your life. What I'm trying to do is tell us what kind of people we should be. 2 Peter 3 and 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation? Here's the answer. 1 Peter 1, 15, but as he which called you is holy, so be ye holy in all your conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now watch what I'm about to say. The word conversation does not mean my talk. The word conversation literally translates in the Greek. It means in my lifestyle in the things that I do. Let me say something. Preachers and teachers, fathers and mothers, business people, whoever you are and whatever you do, please understand that there is a call from heaven that we strive to live lives of integrity because everything rises and falls on leadership and what's on you, preachers and teachers, will get on those that listen to you. What's on you, parents, will get on your children. What's on you, bosses? Well, get on those you employ. And please, every father, listen to me for a moment. One specialist dealing with addictive and destructive behavior stated that 99% of the people he worked with came from homes where there was an absent or bad father. Richard Dorch says that the deception revolves around the usage of bad or absent in that the danger is believing that because we're in the home, therefore I'm not absent, so I must be okay. Others say, I'm not a person who batters and I don't beat my children, therefore I am not a bad parent, I must be okay. But watch how he sums this up. He says abusive power has as much to do with omission as it does commission. It's not always what we actually commit that determines the abuse, what we withhold can be equally destructive. When I read that, I thought about that young man who was sitting in his room and his dad bust, burst through the door and he was smoking, smoking pot and his dad, he said, who taught you to do that? The boy hesitated for a while and then he looked up at his father and he says, you did, daddy. You taught me to do that. Let me go back to Dr. Rutland. When he was talking about that pastor, he went on to say that pastor's attitude is indicative of a deep wound in our society. When we can no longer identify which situations demand courageous responses, then we no longer know when to take a stand. Finally, we lose our understanding of what courage is. If society misdefines courage, it is on the verge of barbarism. Courage is that willingness to deny my own flesh and do what is right and noble regardless the cost. Now listen to me. Where we focus our worship will determine who we fear. One pastor tells of when his daughters Hannah and Nancy were two and three years old, he noticed that they imitated and reflected him and his wife. They cooked, fed, and disciplined their play animals and dolls just the way his wife cooked, fed, and disciplined them. They gave play medicine to their dolls just the way the parents fed the medicine. Their daughters prayed with their stuffed animals and dolls the way they prayed for them. They talked on their toy telephone with the same kind of Texas accent that his wife uses when she talks on the phone. Then he makes this point. Most people, I am sure, have seen this with children. But children only begin what we continue to do as adults. We imitate. 
Most people can think back to junior high, high school, or even college when they were in a group and to one degree or another, whether consciously or unconsciously, they reflected and resembled that peer group. All of us, even adults, reflect what we are around. We reflect things in our culture and society. He says the principle is this. What we revere, we resemble, either for ruin or restoration. Now, I want you to hear this, saints. To commit ourselves to some part of creation more than the creator is idolatry. And when we worship something in creation, we become like that we worship. We become as spiritually lifeless and insensitive to God as a piece of wood, rock, or stone. Please receive this. We will only refuse to give up our integrity no matter the cause, only when we fear God more than man, the creator more than the created. But we will never fear God more than man until we come to the place where he alone is the center of our worship, until he alone is our desire and the very air that we breathe. See, a lack of fear and reverence of a holy God has the ability to disable our ability to walk in, in integrity. Number four, a conscious, unconscious disregard for the law, a conscious, unconscious disregard for the law. It says in James 2, 10 through 11, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Very simply put, when it comes to integrity, when it comes to character, you don't get to pick and choose which of God's laws you will obey. Now let me just help somebody today. That is true in the natural and the spiritual realm that we live in. Let me tell you why most Christians struggle to live holy lives. It is because we go about God's law the same way in our lives that we go about man-made laws. The next time you run through that stop sign because there's no policeman there, everybody say, woo-hoo, well, glory. The next time you decide, well, the light may be red, but it's 4 o'clock in the morning. Who's going to see? Let me talk to you for a minute. To walk in integrity, we must understand that in either kingdom, you cannot pick or choose. You must seek to walk in integrity in both kingdoms. Now, I'm going to really mess with some of your minds because some Christians have the mindset that we can disobey God's the laws of the land and we can still be right with God. Let me say it again. We think we can disobey the laws of the land and still be right with God. Well, thank you. I got some testimony over here. Listen to me. We will look at what we perceive to be a man-made law and say we don't have to obey them. Let me help you. Would you say, say help, help him, Jesus? Romans 13, 1 through 7. Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For these, there is no authority except that which God has established. Now look at me. You may not like today's president. There's probably a whole lot of you in this room, and don't answer me. You probably really didn't like the one before him. But let me talk to you for a minute. While you may not agree with them, you are to pray for them, and you are to say God used them in spite of themselves, because please understand, this Bible says there is no authority except that which God has established. In other words, nobody becomes president just because you voted. Come on, somebody. Well, hallelujah. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For the rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you want to be free of, the, of, of fear of authority? Watch, now here comes the answer. Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Now look at me again. There are crooked preachers, there are crooked politicians, 
There are crooked police. There are crooked lawyers. There are crooked judges. There are crooked teachers. There are crooked lot of people. But let me say something. Most people that I just listed and others, they are in it for the right reason. And listen, like any other profession, there are crooks, but most of them are good. And most importantly, the Bible says, for the one of you who is in authority is God's servant for your good. Then it says, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. Now I know some of y'all, as soon as you see a policeman heading your way, chills run down your spine. You don't even have to be doing anything wrong. You just get scared. Listen now. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. If you ain't doing wrong in most cases, what are you worried about? Therefore, it is necessary to submit, submit, submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. In other words, you don't ex exercise integrity just because you don't want to get in trouble. You exercise integrity because you have a conscience toward God that says, I'm going to do what's right even when nobody is looking. Now, the scripture goes on to say, here's my favorite part of this scripture, especially in the month of April. I read it and I say, help me, Holy Ghost. Verse 6. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them, including Uncle Sam. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let me see. Some leaders do not command respect. But your job is to give it to them anyway. Give them honor. Pray for them while you're doing it. Because the bottom line is this. You and I cannot have a relationship that is the right one with God if you do not walk in relationship with worldly laws. And those who make and enforce them, you need to obey them. We are to strive to live in integrity in this world and in the kingdom of God. Let me go back to Dr. Rutland. In his book, Character Matters, he tells the story of a couple. Let me show you the spiritual side of it. He once counseled they were living together because it was financially expedient for them to do so. And so he counseled them that one or the other of them should move out. He urged them to establish a clean relationship for a full year, to get married only on the solid foundation of a virtuous relationship. They explained to him how it would be extremely difficult for them financially. He assured them that they knew he knew it would take great courage to act virtuously. He said, I was amazed when they accepted my advice because believe me when I tell you this, church, when a pastor says, why don't y'all split up and not live together, it is so rare when people do what we ask them to do. He said the expense was not only financial. Their bodies had activated an appetite for each other. They were enjoying all the benefits. Listen, 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 listen. All the benefits of marriage sexually with none of the responsibilities of the commitment. Now watch this. That's a very difficult thing to do to reverse it, but they did. They acted with tremendous courage, and God blessed them with it. And Dr. Rutland said, one of the most satisfying moments of my ministry was receiving a letter from them more than a year later as they honeymooned in Italy. Let me read you what the letter says. Dear Dr. Rutland, this is the greatest moment of our lives because we know that we acted as God wanted us to do. Now we have come on this honeymoon together from the foundation stone of a virtuous relationship. If we had gone on living together and gotten married, we would have been asking the church to solemnize what we were already doing. Now we know that our marriage is founding, founded in Christ. We are so happy. Listen, church. Courage is the first and greatest element of character in order to walk in integrity. Hear what I'm about to say. And merely knowing what is chaste or honest or to be true is not enough. 
Integrity knows not only the things that are right, but understands that all laws, whether the earthly origin or of heavenly origin and biblical origin, they apply to the child of God. A conscious, unconscious disregard for the law can disable our ability to walk in integrity. Now, let me close by telling you why I labeled that point as such. Church, listen to me. We are numb and ignorant today as to what is right anymore. Years ago, I read this powerful illustration found in a book titled The Day America Told the Truth by James Patterson and Peter Kim. They used the survey technique that guaranteed the privacy of the respondents. They were able to document what Americans really believe and do. First, they found there was no moral authority in America. Americans are making up their own moral codes. Only 13% of us believe in the Ten Commandments. 40% of us believe in five of the Ten Commandments. We choose which laws of God we believe in. There is absolutely no moral consensus in this country as there were in the 1950s when all our institutions commanded respect. Go back and study history. You will find that places like Yale, places like Harvard, they were built upon the principles and the word of God. You look at them now, they are a mess, and they are messing up more young people today than ever. And if you teach there, don't leave, because they need you. They need you. Second, they found Americans are not honest. Lying has become an integral part of American culture, a trait of American character. We lie and don't even think about it. We lie for no reason. The authors estimate that 91% of us lie regularly. Listen to me, church. Lying is so ingrained in our DNA that they also give a list of Americans who are lying. 86% lie to parents, 75% to friends, 73% to siblings, 69% to spouses, 58% to best friends, 49% to neighbors, 32% to doctors, 21% to clergymen. I stopped and I said, that cannot be right. I had more people sit in front of me, and I know they're lying. They're lying like a rug. We'll sit in front of the preacher and lie about lying to the preacher. 20% lie to their lawyers. Listen, we have become so much like this little boy. They asked him one day in Sunday school what a lie was. He looked at his Sunday school teacher, and he looked her right in the eye, and he says a lie is an abomination to God and an everlasting and present help in times of trouble. Well, glory. They found out third. Marriage and family are no longer sacred institutions. While we marry, we have lost faith in the institution of marriage. A third of married men and women confess that they had at least one affair. 30% aren't really sure they still love their spouse. Listen, especially you married folks, listen to me. There's a Spanish proverb that says, an honest man doesn't make himself a, do a, a dog for the sake of a bone. Selah. Fourth, they found that the Protestant work ethic is gone from today's American workplace. Workers around America frankly admit that they spend more than 20%, seven hours a week of their time at work goofing off. That amounts to a four-day work week across the nation. And now what we've done since COVID is we've legalized goofing off. Let me tell you something. When COVID came out, my staff, I told you, you ain't staying home. I don't care if you got to put on four masks. You come into work. Because I knew that once I started letting them stay home, once COVID is over, they're going to still want to stay home. And let me talk to you for a minute. You need to understand that the people on this staff, they work for their paycheck. You ain't going to steal from God. You're going to work for your paycheck. But we're legalizing it. The authors conclude by suggesting that we have a new set of commandments for America. I don't see the point in observing the Sabbath, 77%. I will steal from those who won't really miss it, 74%. I will lie when it suits me, so long as it doesn't cause any real damage, 64%. I will cheat on my spouse, after, my spouse after all, given the chance he or she will do the same, 53%. I will procrastinate at work and do absolutely nothing about a full day every five, 50%. Here's my problem. We say that we are a nation that wants integrity. We demand it of those who work in Washington. 
We demanded of the governor's house, the mayor's house, but yet we who demand it do not live it. We have so wandered away from integrity because we have wandered away from God's laws. So what that means to me is that it is obvious that when people are lacking integrity, they don't even know they're lacking integrity. How many of you have been around people? You see them do something and you go, that makes absolutely no sense. And to them, it is the right thing to do. Because we lack and don't know integrity anymore. Let me close with this. I want to tell you about Ken Wells, who passed away in 2021 at the age of 82. He was an award-winning TV and film producer who started his Hollywood career as an actor. Early in his career, Wells chose to turn down a role because it conflicted with his faith in Christ. While he was under contract with MGM, he was cast into a role where at some point in the script, his character would have to entice a young woman to get drunk so he could take advantage of her. Listen to how Wells described his decision to decline the role. He said, I had been speaking to a lot of church groups and conventions around the country on the subject of right choices. So when I read the script, I had to meet with the director, Vince, Vincent Minnelli to tell him I couldn't do it. He told me, you'll do it or you'll be out of your contract. You'll be on suspension. You'll have no salary for a year, and I'll see that you never work in this town again. I told him that he'd have to find someone else, and he literally threw me out of his office. Wells was put on suspension when the film came out the following year. He was speaking at a youth convention in Denver to about 600 kids. They took a break at dinner time, and everybody piled out to see a movie and get pizza. As they started to walk across the street, there was this huge marquee with a sign for the movie he turned down. And he stepped back, and he said, I thought to myself, what if I'd done that film and the kids had gone in and seen it? Wells went on to say that declining that role propelled him into the role he was destined for as a film and TV producer. He produced award-winning series and films including Christie, East of Eden, and the highly acclaimed movie Amazing Grace. I tried to find articles that would tell me his net worth when he died. I couldn't find any, but let me tell you what I did. I found many articles that said, he was a great man of integrity and character. Final thought. I wear this around my neck. First of all, because I believe in investing in our military. And this one represents the Marines as I made an investment. But I like the Marines, too, because their motto is Semper Fidelis, always faithful. I say, God, that's great, but we're in the greatest military on the people planet. We are Marines. We are soldiers. We are in the army of the Lord. May God ever find us faithful. May God ever find that we're in times where compromise would be easy. That we do the difficult thing and stand up and say, I will not bow in fear to man. I will only bow in fear and reverence of a holy God. Would you stand with us? I want to say something. All of us, me included, the Holy Spirit has us on alert. He is saying to us, in the days ahead, opportunities will come your way. And we must discern between whether this is God or just a good thing. 
And then after we discern that it's just a good thing and not God, are we going to stand in integrity and character and say, God, I'm going to wait on you? Because let me tell you, the enemy of best, it is not worse. The enemy of best is good. Did you hear that? The enemy of best is good. Let's just worship the Lord for a moment. Chira, you are enough. Chira, you are enough. And I, and I will be content in every circumstance. For you are Chira, you are enough. Oh, Chira, you are enough. Before I bless you and step off this platform, two things. Number one, you may have slipped even recently and made a decision that was less than with integrity and character. God is a God of recovery. 
If you will truly repent, the second thing you need to know is that he will wipe the slate clean and you need to understand that he really is more than enough. Sitting in my office and you remember the youth had gone to the youth convention and Pastor Justin called me up from his office and he said, Bishop, I forgot to tell you something. Now, you know me. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, what did our kids do at youth convention? He said, I want to tell you something. While we were at youth convention, we got notice that our $25,000 debt of college has been wiped clean. He said, while we're sitting there getting this, another message comes through where they said we owed 500 and something dollars on a utility. And my wife said, are we going to pay it? And he says, no, because it's not true. And while they're sitting in there, debt canceled. All I'm going to tell you is this. One of the things I told Pastor Justin when he came here, and I tell all my staff, you can mess up, and as long as it doesn't invice, involve something unlawful, I'm going to help you. Just don't lie to me. Because when you lie to me, you're lying to the Holy Ghost. And you may not drop dead physically like Ananias and Sapphira, but you will die spiritually. If you just tell the truth, God will help you. And so, church, whenever you're in a tight place, don't yield. Stand firm and say, this doesn't look good. But Jira, yes. you are more than enough. Yes. More than enough. Would you lift your hands now? May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Would you give the Lord praise one more time? Hallelujah. Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been amazing to worship with you once again. I want to remind you that to stay up to date on our upcoming events and activities, you can visit us at ehconline.org, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We look forward to worshiping with you next Sunday.